are back with another episode of the Dirty Laundry Game Worn Hockey Podcast, episode 36. Um, we had had a great response to last year, starting with uh, the the new year, new collectors. I had some people reach out that had been in the hobby short amount of time and really appreciated some of the the thoughts and advice, and even some some longer term collectors that didn't didn't know stuff or or said they learned new things. So I like those kind of discussions. If if you guys out there listening want certain things covered or have those questions, feel free to reach out to any of us that are on the show on the regular. It doesn't just have to be me. We will gladly throw that into the um, either a full topic on the show or just like a, a quick thing to talk about. So we just, we can't be the only ones coming up with topics. We will take stuff from you. And I've had other people reach out suggesting things and we've got some things in the work. Um, Nick from world hockey jerseys, uh, is coming on next week. So we'll have some back-to-back -back shows in there. I'm working on, uh, Paul, I think you're working on another one for me, uh, down the road soon. I've got a couple in the hopper. Um, so we've got, we're lining up a lot of shows, but if, if you want to be on to discuss what you collect or other things, shoot me a message and we can, we can work it in. There's a couple say I'll fill up. I'll do the show every week. If we've got people to do it instead of the, every, the, every other one, it's normal hockey stuff. So anybody that's that's watching this on YouTube realizes who the hell's that with Paul? Um, may or may not know our next guest. And Paul, I'll let you do the introductions because he's in your office. Yes. <laughs> so th this is John Akasoni. Hi, everyone. He um, actually lives here in San Jose, uh, just a couple miles from us. We've known him for ages now, I guess. And good friend. Um, very, very happy to have him on the show. Um, one of the main reasons why I have him on here is he was involved in the hobby way back in the 90s, back before the Red Wings won their first of the last four um, Stanley Cups, before Michigan won two football national championships. Uh, <laughs> it's it's been it's been a long, long time. Let's just put it that way. And um, he's also the founder of GameWorn.net, which he'll get into. And um, just a great guy in the hobby is always helpful. And we're. I can't believe we haven't had you on till now. So, well, welcome, thanks, John. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Appreciate it. Of course, and and welcome, John. And and it's it's cool because all three of us have been, like I said before, we started recording this. I I joined the forum, and we'll get into the more details when I was nineteen, twenty years old. I'm forty five now, and it's crazy to think about. We start when we all start looking at dates. That couldn't have been that long ago. Then we actually start doing the math. Like, holy crap, that's a long time. So we'll get into some of that in a minute. A couple other things I wanted to touch on, uh, hobby news related and stuff, is I want to thank, um, first, the owner of the Vegas Golden Knights Martinez jersey for reaching out to me, showing me the the air that is in it. And for anybody that that somehow missed that between the what I consider Paul's the main game-worn uh, Facebook page and the Vegas Golden Knights game-worn page, he got a... Uh, set one or, or first period Martinez Vegas jersey, but on the inside, the set stamp from Vegas said Jack Eichel. So there was questions of, and I had a uh, an hour plus phone call with the owner of this jersey asking what I would do, my thoughts, different things, and we we looked at different scenarios and hashed things out. And I look at it as a, it's an error. Does it add value? That's questionable, but he was a little bit worried that, okay, it says Eichel in there. Are people going to think I somehow changed a jersey? It should have been Eichel, and now it's Martinez, stripped, all those kind of things. And I said, you're safe because you also have the Fanatics set stamp in there. And that number, if you run it through Fanatics page, explains that it's the Martinez jersey, first period, all this kind of stuff. Somebody in Vegas, when they threw those set stamps in, screwed up. The thing we were trying to find, and I have yet to see an answer from anybody, is what does the Eichel have in it? I've not seen that pop up in any groups. If if you're the owner of that and even just want to send me a couple pictures to verify it, I would love it. I will not say, if you don't want your identity known, I'm 100% good with that, but I'm just curious to see if it made it out there. What did you guys think of that? So my favorite solution on that, someone suggested that 
they contact Vegas and get to set tag for Martinez. Not so at in or anything, but have both set tags. This way, they don't have to worry about sending the jersey to Vegas because they didn't buy it from Vegas. They bought it from Fanatics. Um, and it's it's one of those weird, you know, it's out of sync with that. Uh, I, I know everyone says, well, you can check the Fanatics database. I don't trust that thing to be around in five years. I mean, it, it could be, but everyone knows I'm not the biggest fan of Fanatics. And um, I, I don't have faith in them doing things right and maintaining it. And yes, I'll go on the record anywhere saying that. Um, so I, I think it would be really good if they can get to set tag and not necessarily have it sewn in because who knows what happens when you send it back to Vegas and ship back and Fanatics is the one, the ones who sold it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I agree. Um, sending it back comes with a whole bunch of risks, but I'm of a little different perspective here, which is, you know, if it wasn't before, it certainly is a part of the history of the Jersey. Now, the fact that the error exists and, and I, would i think if it were my jersey what i would want is to keep it the way it is because that's how it was presumably used and to get a letter either from fanatics or the golden knights attesting to the fact that it was a teammate error so that you can have that to sort of back up with the story but one of the nice things about um these communities we have now is that there's this whole discussion about it now that people can also reference as um you know further uh proof to the the story behind it no, and no, and those are that that seemed to kind of be the consensus. And I haven't heard back. I need to follow up with the owner um, because between him watching the the conversation, different groups, some other conversations he had with me and some others, that was the same consensus as, hey, get that tag if they'll send it to you. Keep it with the jersey. Keep any documentation you have. And he was working through NHL auctions fanatics on this and in um and and again nice enough that this person did send me copies of the emails and it said um they were they weren't actually waiting to hear from the golden knights they were waiting from here to hear from the company that stitched did all the stitching because it was their fault so it wasn't whoever does the lettering for vegas and i i don't know who that is um said it was was done by them and not by the team directly this is directly from uh from the nhl auctions email they guarantee authenticity of the matter that it was worn by alec martinez uh please keep in mind that this jersey was collected by an official from nhl shortly after usage unfortunately since they only checked the outside of the jersey for quality control part of the event the incorrect tag size in the jersey went unnoticed they did offer him a full refund which which is fun. And I think that was actually the standing thing for these auctions is there was a refund available for any of them. It wasn't just in this case. Um, I'd have to go double check the the auction stuff, but I believe that was always disclosed up front as you could, if you didn't like the Jersey, you could actually ask for a refund, which I'm a little surprised about on an auction, but um, they uh, um, said that being said, if you want to re re full refund, you can, or if you're still interested in keeping a jersey, we provide you with a prepaid shipping label to have this jersey game used jersey shipped directly to the stitchers to have the tag replaced with the correct one for Alec Martinez. And again, as we discussed here and seen across the, the uh, Facebook pages, everybody thought that was a terrible idea because you're if it's lost in transit, if somebody steals it, that's a one of four jerseys and who knows where it ends up. So I have not gotten any more um, uh, any more info. He, like I said, the the owner did ask them to have the stitcher have the Vegas Golden Knights send him just that set stamp. But I'll follow up uh, before the next show and find out if what they said to that. If they said nope, we can't do it. But at least I will say this: Fanatics in NHL auctions has been very reasonable and given. I mean, trying to work with the owner, which I appreciate. Because with some of the the negative things that have happened, I at least appreciate them making a a a reasonable effort in understanding the frustration. So um, good on them in this case. I'll always give kudos when they're deserved. Um, Paul, you've got one that happened yesterday. Oh, that's right. We had the Barracuda Pink in the Rink auction, and the game was on Saturday. Was it? Yes, and, and the auction started. 
I think that day, and it closed yesterday, which was Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, especially, you know, one game wonder jerseys, uh, very nice jerseys um, for a breast cancer fundraiser. Turns out uh, the auction was supposed to close at 5 p.m. on GiveSmart. Uh, everyone gets their bids in, and the auction keeps going and going. A little bit of conversation on Twitter, emails to them. They manually finally shut it down at 520. So I don't know why they did not use the countdown timer. I even asked a friend, like, you know, doesn't GiveSmart have, you know, well, why doesn't GiveSmart have a countdown timer? It's like they do. They just didn't enable it. Hmm. So um, what the CUDA ended up doing, they got rid of all bids that came in at five o'clock or later. So if you bid at 459, you were good. If you bid anywhere at five o'clock, no matter how many seconds in the first minute, those bids were all thrown out. And there were some bids as late as I think like 520. Um, so all that got thrown out, it looks like uh, they've gotten all the winners sorted out. Monica and I won a jersey uh, in that we haven't gotten the notification that to pay for it or anything yet. We have gotten the notification on the screen. You've won. But um, my understanding, though, is this is the second time this has happened at a Barracuda auction. Hmm. And the first one, assuming it was supposed to close at five, they actually counted the bids at five, not throwing those out and threw out any bids at 501 and later. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm just, I don't know if that was the closing time last time, sake of example. But what I would love to see from the CUDA. It's just learn how to use the countdown timer. Then there's no, yeah. There, there, this this there, isn't a new platform, folks. Yeah, it, it, it's it's going to a great cause and all that, and you got people upset because they don't know if they won, they don't know if they lost, they kept bidding, um, and it's something that was really positive, which had a negative issue with it. So where did they document that it was closing at five? Like in their in their media and the notification, like the text notifications for the auction. Um, in their advertising on Twitter or X, um, Facebook, I think. I'm not sure on Instagram. But also, if you go to the Barracuda homepage on GiveSmart, I, I think it's like en.givesmart.com, and there, you don't go to any auctions. It lists all their uh, auctions, past and present. That all actually said it closed at 5 p.m. Okay. But, you know, which... Somebody just screwed up the timer. So at least they did document that, hey, this is what time it ends. So it was clear. It's not like they forgot it everywhere and people were like, okay, when's this stop? Oh, they kept promoting it on Twitter. Everyone knew it ended at okay. five. Okay, good. Like, um, and, but yeah, it, it was, but there was no countdown timer at, at all. So it's, so you had no idea how much was left besides. Yeah. And the weird, and the weird thing about that end time is if you had said it ends at 7.59, People, I, I think, have it built into their expectation that 759 also means 759 and 59 seconds. Whereas when you say eight o'clock, it's eight o'clock, not eight o'clock in one second. And so yeah. I think that once you introduce that type of ambiguity, it, it opens up a lot of confusion, which seems like it did. Yeah. And, and on top of that, they did it differently last time they had this mistake. So mm. just yeah. don't do it again. Well, and yeah, just know to set a timer. And if you, you, or even put a disclosure thing of, hey, please understand if something happens to the timer, anything's after this time will be retracted and the the correct winners will be noted. Just, just clarify some points to make it smoother. Or just, yeah, again, Paul, like you said, do it right the first time, not worry about it. And, but I'll also add in from the user perspective, um, Give Smart takes a reserve bid. So if the jersey's at 500 bucks and you're willing you know, you know, you don't have to bid 510. You can bid a thousand and put, you know, as um, proxy bidding or whatever they call mm -hmm. it. Someone else bids 510, you get bumped to 520. You don't get bumped to a thousand. Right. And, I mean, that's how I bid on the jersey we want. I put in a, a much higher reserve bid than what we wanted at and very happy with, with what happened. But it's mm -hmm. a lot of the, th there's ways to, as a user, to avoid this happening too, even when they screw up. And I'm glad they didn't keep the bids, which happened at 520. Um, yeah, because you'd have more people pissed if all those bids were kept than yeah. them getting than the ones who went beyond five o'clock getting to to, uh, to complain that their bids were canceled. It's, At least there, it does remind me of the old Avalanche auction a couple of years ago on Give Smart when they had one time posted, 
and um, they actually ended it like three, four hours before that. Hmm. Oops. And this was just a couple of years ago. It was regular season set. I'll, I'll have to check hmm. with Gordy on the exact details. Because I was going to bid on the group hour for him. You know, he's oh, the auction ends at five, uh, common time. And um, at noon, he mails, uh, messages me. It's they've already closed the auction. And it's like the, a lot of abs jerseys went for way below uh, market, market value. I uh, bet they did. Because you expect a lot of people will wait till the last minute because they want to see where those jerseys are to put their bids in on them. Yeah, some like you, and, and I've done this before too with the Blues. They use the same give smart is set my proxy bid. And I know I'm comfortable on this jersey to this level. As long as it goes up to that, I'm fine. Yeah. But yeah, that, that one sounds pretty screwy. This one is an interesting one. And, and we normally shame strippers and not the ones on the stage that take dollar bills or $2 in the dark that look like 20s. Uh, these being the Jersey strippers, um, the Liberty Bell jerseys, which I knew nothing about. My wife actually shared this because she saw it in a TikTok talking about this company. Liberty Bell jerseys, uh, they're on Twitter, have this out. LB jerseys uh, is their handle. Uh, talking about Carter Hart, McLeod, Dylan Doob, and Cal Foot. Uh, we know that is a complete disaster. A lot of, um, and I will say this now, guilty until proven isn't innocent, be it U.S. court, Canadian court, wherever you are, things look bad. In the case, just a side note, in case anybody hadn't seen it yet or listening to this, Carter Hart is a now a non-rostered player for Philly, made that announcement today. I'm not sure the status of the other three. I haven't seen those posts, but Hart stuff came up in, in my flipping through social media. But Liberty oh. Bell jerseys, they they must do um, replicas, authentics, things like that. But they are offering, if you have any of the jerseys with these players' names on them, they will strip them for free. Not clear if it's name and number both. Uh, you reach out to them, they'll give you some of the details. But for free, it, just a $35 donation to a charity that specializes in helping the victims of uh, sexual violence. They offer one. Example, uh, Philadelphia has one uh, that they, they uh, give an example of. It's been shared a ton. So it's it's in one case, I'm OK to say, hey, if you have a replica or an authentic um, of, of one of these guys, you're not comfortable with it. Reach out to Liberty Bell jerseys. Uh, it's it's great that, that they're offering to do it. Sounds like they really know what they're doing and and sending it to different sexual violent charities. So for once, we'll say good on stripping. <laughs> um any yes um only other thing like i said all-star games going on this weekend i was out to dinner earlier and saw the draft and myself i don't give a damn about the the all-star jersey or, or all-star game this year the jerseys we've we've covered and not big fans but just the i know the nhl is trying to streamline and make this better but when you don't even have all the guys doing the the, the uh um the stuff tomorrow night with skills competition that takes a lot out of it. That's what most people watch it for. They don't give a damn about the game. What about you guys? I have not watched an NHL all-star game in decades. Uh, when I was here in San Jose, we actually had an expo, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great time. I did go to the all-star media the, the media day that that year and that was fun hearing all the interviews but i have no interest in the game or the skills we'll talk about the ahl all-star game at the end of the show yes we will um and it, it just i like watching the skill stuff especially as they've allowed the the players to have more fun dress in crazy outfits do crazy stuff because it shows the players personalities you don't always get to see so i i enjoy that but now that not all the guys are doing it like uh the blues have robert thomas there He's not doing anything in the skills competition. Okay, well, what the what's the point? And I'm I'll be curious too. I'm trying to do some digging to research it. Is they they drafted the players to different teams? Okay, like Thomas now has a a Blues All Star jersey. What to stand on the ice with? It's I mean he's not even doing anything with it other than to stand around in it. So you've got a bunch of players start checking if your guy did anything in the skills competition, because if you happen to get his all-star Jersey, he may have not done Jack in it. So, or put it on for that matter. 
So just be aware of that. Um, a side note thing too, for anybody that was watching, some of the teams were doing their own skills competition right before the break. Chikrin got 107.1 slap shot. Ottawa was doing her own little thing with their fans and yeah, hit 107.1. Uh, Zach McEwen was right behind him at 106.6. My slap shot usually is about 35. So we, we see where that lands. All right, so the the meat of this uh, fun evening and and a tighter office at Paul's house, um, John will will the the floor is yours, sir. Yo, well, again, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, this came about from I think a couple things. One is that I you know I was just chatting with with Paul. I had the 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 realization that it's been over twenty five years since. Um, I started GameWorn.net, and I just went on this nostalgic journey, uh, went back through some old emails, um, reminding my, yeah, I got P PTSD of remembering what it was like to to run a, a community such as that. Um, but also, you know, we're, uh, you know, we have a local uh, Jersey Expo uh, this weekend, and so I'll be sort of, you know, being present with a bunch of collectors where I've been mostly, you know, on the periphery for the last few years. And so I just thought, you know, maybe it's a good time to kind of uh, talk about GameWorn.net. Um, you know, this is, I, I guess mostly for some of the old timers. Uh, I haven't been associated officially with the site in just over 20 years. Um, as you guys recall, I've I released all, you know, the domain and the, the assets to Spivik and Crowd, and it's been their show for, you know, the last couple decades but you know i i do believe that there was a heyday associated with gameworn.net in the late 90s and the early 2000s that were were really great times for me um and i just kind of wanted to share how gameworn.net came about uh, you know it's early days and um uh you know how how it sort of grew to be the 20,000 person community it, it did uh, at its peak and just, I mean, bef what what was your background before you started that page? Were you in Were you in tech? Were you in something else? And just like, you know what, I like the hobby, and and I guess how much were you in the hobby at that point? And I mean, what so do you know what I'm going to be the guy that's because I before you, I don't know that there was really any central forum for for hockey uh, collecting for game worn collecting. Yeah, you know, there was just a couple. Um uh things that had gone on you know before i started the site but it was really just like one one moment in uh 1996 there was a local sports memorabilia show in san jose Milt byron had a booth there so i met him that day on the same day i met uh mitch amaya uh mitch was sort of like this grumpy guy who didn't want to really uh discuss where he got his jerseys and was very secretive about everything but oh just like today <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh so you know this this kind of started with milt asking me because i i am you know i am in tech uh i was doing a lot of website stuff at the time and so milt asked me for help um with you know sort of revamping his own uh, uh byron's hockey land site which you know i agreed to do but along the way um you know you know as um Paul likes to remind us that the Red Wings had a couple of back-to-back -back champions championships. And, you know, I was a fan of the Red Wings at the time. And I was like, wow, if, if you can get game worn jerseys, you know, and that that's really what happened with my meeting with Mill. is like, wow, I didn't know you could actually acquire this stuff. It's pretty cool. So then I started to look into the Red Wings and there's just like no information. And it really was like digging deep uh, into what was, you know, a very sparse internet back in, you know, 1998. I mean, there was like hardly any content there, but the Detroit Free Press happened to have an article about the Red Wings selling their jerseys from their, their championship season. And so, you know, I called the Red Wings, got all that information and realized at the end of it is like, there are probably other teams, you know, in the NHL, minor leagues, juniors, whatever, who are doing the same thing, but I just have no way of knowing it. And, and that's really what was the... um sort of the uh the 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 start of the idea of a of a website with a community that could um sort of bring the hobby to the forefront and and get others to uh, crowdsource the information on how to get a lot of the stuff that you know we're all looking for 
So no, and, and you know, and that's a fantastic way to come up with that. And so you you went to this expo, I guess. But before we get into more of the the page ideas and and some of that, how it kept taking off, were you just getting into hockey collecting, or did you end up at this expo? just like as a kind of fringe, I want to see what this is all about. I think I started uh, where a lot of people did, which was like hockey cards, right? And then like, you know, I I, I think I, at that point had bought myself a couple of uh, authentic jerseys, um, you know, only because I didn't think it was possible to get game-worn jerseys. So that was sort of like the, the, the next best thing. So I was already, you know, a fan of hockey and, you know, just a collector of many things, you know, game worn jerseys is just one of the things I collect. So it was, um, it, it was, it was like very natural for me to, to roll into the game worn jerseys, like head first. And I mean, we know guys like Milt who advertise in, in the, the hockey magazines and, and other guys had those lists and you, you're right. Where the hell did these come from? How did they get them from the team? What did they do? So you you got this this light bulb goes off and you're like, you know what? I want to put this page together. So kind of tell us how how you got that started and then how did you start recruiting people to join the page? Uh well, for those of you who um were back at the you know very beginning, you may recall that it, it wasn't game worn.net yet. In 1998, it was called the Game Worn Jersey Collector, and it had this goofy flash intro, like all pages back in the late yeah, 90s. Those, had those some 90s, anime. 90s flash pages. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the you know, the sort of buy and sell feature was completely rudimentary. Like it was literally an HTML page that I had to maintain, which means that if someone had something to sell, you would email me their, you know, information and I would have to like maintain this page and keep track of when things were like sold and all that kind of stuff. And it was horrible. Oh God, just the man hours to do yeah. that. I can't imagine. Yeah. But you know, it's worth noting that it was, it was shocking to me how many people like found the page um, uh, on their own and started uh, um, interacting with me about, you know, about jerseys. And, you know, this is, this is a time where, um, you know, there were very few dealers. The, the landscape of dealers at the time was very different than it is today. I mean, of course, you know, you had guys like Milt, this is a little bit before Migrate became known. I think Barry was already doing his thing, but it wasn't it wasn't the company it was before. I mean, you had companies like, you know, Jeff at the Stick Rack, um, Hutch, Harvey Cohen, right? His his business. And then um uh, the the real old timers will remember a site called the Grand Unified Theory in Canada and their infamous uh jerks wall where they would like flame all the people that they felt burned them over the years. But I mean, it, it was, it was, you know, I, I think you had said earlier um, off air is that, you know, it was the wild west. Um, and so, um, you know, um, around, um, I gotta check my notes here, October of 98 was the big turning point where uh, Beckett Hockey, the, the, the hockey card magazine ran a full article on the game worn uh, hockey jersey collector. Uh, and that just like blew open the floodgates. I mean, I just I just realized that at that point I could not just manually manage this, you know, this board. It was doing the job it was intended, but it was it was not um, suitable for a manual process. So that's when I started GameWorn.net and bought a subscription to that horrible bulletin board product <laughs> um, that you know was the staple of the site for you know the next five or six years. But you know what? It served its purpose. It was was plain and basic, but it served its purpose. And you could, if memory serves correctly, because it's been a long time since I've been on it, I think you could put pictures in there so you could see what the jersey looks like and, and different things. So, I mean, at the time, that was, I would consider cutting edge. And, and I'm, everybody on this podcast has been in IT. I'm I'm still currently a, a, an IT manager for a university. Oh. Paul's got a background in it. So do you. So, I mean, we've grown up and watched how pages were. We can look at them now and go, God, those things were terrible and ugly. But back then, that was cutting edge. Yeah. And, you know, I went through the, uh, you know, as, you know, the old uh, dot com 
you know, adage around, uh, you know, if you're successful, your server will crash. And um, there was a period of time where the site was not available after the first like five minutes of at, at each hour, because it would use up all of its traffic in the first oh, five minutes of each hour and it shut down. And it's just like, um, you know, I, I had to turn to sponsors just to help keep the site running and to, you know, buy more um, bandwidth and stuff. So, because that wasn't I, back then, people take for granted, oh, I can throw up a website, it's nothing. But back then, the cost of bandwidth and all that stuff was expensive as hell. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. what the first year or the first few month cost was back then for that stuff? You know, I don't remember, but I was happy to pay it at the time uh, just because, you know, I was eager to, to see the site grow. But, you know, over the course of, you know, month after month after month, it's, it starts to to stack up. So I was able to, you know, get uh, I think Leland's was the first big sponsor I got. I think I had an Amazon link, which, you know, like back the when Amazon program. was books. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah. um and uh uh i started to integrate uh this wasn't the sponsor part of it but you know i i, you know, I had milt become part of the forum he had his own you know little byron's hockey land channel uh, uh brian kersman at dropped the gloves had his enforcer forum and i think you know i stuck my head i haven't been to gameworn.net forum since i i left it basically but i sort of peeked in on it right before I, I came in to join you guys. And I noticed that structurally, a lot of those things are still there. Like they have the enforcer forum and all that kind of stuff. So um, it seems like those things are still being used, which is, which is great. They just don't have the affiliation with, with drop the gloves or melt anymore. And it's uh, as this continued to grow, do you happen to, to know or remember what the, what the membership was after the first year? The first year, I mean, I think it was like somewhere between 500 and 1,000, which was a huge number wow. at the time. I mean, it was just like, wow, this is this is nuts, you know, and then, you know. And I guess, to, to, okay. sorry, to go, to go back on that really quick, what did you expect? Did you have kind of a, a, a hopeful number in mind of, okay, if I get 50 members the first year, I'm going to be ecstatic, something like that, or do you remember? I didn't because I didn't have any... I, I didn't have an end game for the site. It was just, it, it was initially just very self-serving. As I said, I was just looking for ways to get, you know, tap into more uh, information about, about jerseys. And it was certainly doing its job uh, for that. So I wasn't really thinking ahead. You know, I had no monetization plan whatsoever. It was really just like, you know, how can we keep the, the good times rolling? Um, and that really was my priority. And I eventually got to like 20K members and i remember like people constantly accusing me of like creating like fake accounts i was like for what you know it's not it doesn't serve a purpose. Like, <laughs> um but there was a lot of there was a lot of people i i'm sure like a good percentage of those were people creating like duplicate accounts come in and troll other people i mean that you know with any growing community is inevitable um but uh yeah and it's and i don't remember what exactly year i joined but it it was was way back in there. I had just gotten into collecting. I learned through junior team here about that and then was a fan of St. Louis. And would, you'd go down to the games down there and see them on the wall or in the case for sale and started picking them up. And, and again, probably either stumbled across your page somehow and joined And it. And it was, it was so interesting to get in there because it's a knowledge base that you didn't know exist. I mean, we, we take that for granted now with, with social media, with Facebook, with Twitter, with again, being able to throw up some kind of a forum on, on the web and it be up and polished in 10 minutes. And here within a day, you've got 5,000 people joining it. It's, wow. it wasn't like that. Again, a lot of people, 98 to, to 2000 even may have still been on dial up or probably were. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so your page wasn't, it wasn't an intensive, I mean, the, the little, if I remember right, the Jersey pictures were, were uh, very small. And I think you could cook on them to, to blow them up. If I remember right. And, and correct me on any of this, if I'm wrong, yeah. it's just my memory is fading on some of that, but you couldn't upload, but you could uh, embed. A that's, link. Yes. That's what it was. Uh, Cause we, we had, Put them up, host them up on our own on geo cities or or <laughs> things like that. Yeah. But it's yeah, you can tell how old I am. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it 
it was just amazing to start getting in there and linking with people and find out crap. There's 50 other blues fans and okay, you can have this Jersey or, you know, how they sell them or here, who's here's who you need to talk to. Or, um, one of the, the, the per- people I made friends with on there and, and still am to this day is Jeff Jones. A lot of people know Jeff, um, was in the Macomb area when I met him and, and I'm in central Illinois and, and, um, I remember it sticking out as his, at the time, I don't remember how old it was. His his daughter was having some health issues. He posted a bunch for sale and people just jumped on it to help him out, give money, help support his daughter. And it was one of those, a, a unity of the community thing. And, and I just love seeing that on a, on a forum that the only way to communicate. And I think you had private messaging, like pe- people could me- private message you for, Jersey questions, buying stuff, whatever, but it was, it was so basic yet so advanced. And we, that's where we started making all these connections that a lot of us still have. You know, the moment that I realized it was a a real community and not just a collection of, you know, individuals sort of like transacting was, um, 9-11. I, that was like really, um, surreal, um, the day of and the, and the weeks, days and weeks following to see how many people came to the site to, to talk about, you know, what was happening, uh, how they felt about it. And of course, old timers are also remember um, uh, the support, you know, we gave uh, Ken Mace, who has also passed on now uh, for his brother, Robert, um, and, and sort of the, 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 the struggle that he was going through, you know, I still have the the patch that he, you know, uh, gave out to everyone. And, you know, that's when it felt like, wow, this is more than just a site. This is like a, a, a tight knit group of people that, you know, generally care about each other. And um, it, 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 it changed things for me. And that's even now. And, and, and Paul and I preached that and the other guests that we have on here. And, and again, we took, you guys will talk about it at the expo out there this weekend every expo that comes up is yeah the jerseys are what we bring bring us all together but it's those it's those friendships it's those those connections we make and and it goes beyond jerseys you may be messaging whoever on a jersey deal and then you find you're checking in on hey how's your how's your family how's this heard this is going on is it's we're all like that i'm i'm like that with paul and and other guys it's it's beyond the fabric it's it is a big family because when when like you said with with uh with Ken Mace and and like I said with with uh Jeff Jones when when things happened when they needed moral support monetary support those things the community was there and and yeah I could imagine how you felt with that because I I'm guessing that's not what you expected this to to wow. grow into when it started. Right. It was just a transaction based platform and nothing more. But then, you know, people, you know, as as you pointed out, you know, you start realizing there's more people locally or at least within driving range that have common interests. And you're starting to like build, you know, like stronger bonds with those people. And um, that was, I would say, far and away, the the biggest payoff for me is kind of seeing like how, you know, like, wow, I've inadvertently created this this community. It's not what I set out to do, but it's a great byproduct of, uh, you know, of all the work, not just I put into, but all the people that raised their hands to be moderators at the time, you know, is it was a uh, it was a uh, pretty heavy lifting. I mean, we we see that now between all the all the Facebook groups. Paul, you are on several. I'm on a bunch. Um, it's it's always almost always a thankless job. Sometimes it's quite entertaining, but John back then for you and the other moderators, that had to be probably kind of a, of a, a learning experience. I'm assuming for, for all of you. Yeah. I mean, the in, not just the internet, but I think like online communities were fairly nascent uh, back then. And so everyone had an opinion of how, you know, the forum community should operate. I got a lot of like you know, I had enough people giving me like really great ideas and constructive criticism about it, but I also had a a lot of people just like flaming me for like, you know, not being too much of an enforcer or not being enough of an enforcer. And so it started to get very um, challenging, but, you know, I'd always tell people, it's like, look, this is a microcosm of a real society. You're not going to be able to please everyone. So all you can do is sort of make sure that you're 
values are clearly stated and that you, you know, you, you follow them and, you know, be, you know, uh, uh, sort of reliable uh, along the lines of the things that you preach. And that's the best that you can do. Um, but, you know, in, 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 in mentioning that, that's actually what kind of led to me kind of like just thinking that it was time to move off of, uh, off of the forum. So there were, there were, there were a couple of things going on in my life. One is that I was, I was in the middle of a divorce. This is like 2002, 2003. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think the forum was at its absolute largest and I had a lot of people writing to me about how they were going to sue me for allowing, you know, like libel and all this kind of stuff. And look, I knew it wasn't going to stand up. But I didn't want to have to retain legal counsel to like run this thing that was a, you know, that was like it's a, just a big hobby. Yeah, you don't expect yeah, to need and, a lawyer for it. And, you know, like I, I do have like sort of seller's remorse of of letting all this because, I, you know, I, I, I did see a path forward. I think, you know, with the divorce and all that, it was just like a little bit too much. Right. And so, so I, I and, kind of, and like, we all get that. I mean, I've, I've been through one of those and, and you're right is your priorities and your focus change. And we, we see how the, how keyboard warriors are in 2024 on the forums and, and, or the forums, sorry, the Facebook groups. Um, and again, dictating the same thing as you should be doing this or you should be blocking this person. It's it's constant pissing matches and yeah. they existed back then, too. So mm -hmm. and to go back just a little bit, I, I, and I don't remember it clear enough, but was there what was the mechanism when people caused problems? Did you was there something where you locked them out or were they they booted or did you monitor them? I don't I don't remember how that worked back then. Yeah, so, Facebook, it's easy. Your ass is blocked or, or so many days you're, you're not able to use the page. Yeah. I mean, in, in the, in an ideal scenario, you know, I, myself or one of the moderators would just catch something that was just, you know, egregious and we would handle it through usually like a, you know, first, second, third type of offense thing. We'd send out, you know, a little refresher on the code of conduct and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and and try and keep booting someone as like the last resort because that's you know I, I you know as a, a community of adults I expected people to you know sort of you know you know just self regulate themselves you know um, but after a while it just turned into people emailing me and the moderators like this guy is like insulting me or this guy is ripping me off and just like just like. Those are the emails I was kind of going through um, earlier today again and just seeing like I would get like 20 a day of people just like, you got to ban this guy. You got to kick this guy off. He's like, he like, like dropped an F-bomb and my kids saw it. I mean, like literally to that level of it. And Jeez. just like, I tried, I saw that I tried to like respond to everyone. But to be honest, there was like, not everything I was going to act on, right? I mean, some of it is sort of like, you guys need to figure this out yourselves. And that's, that's be, be an adult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So as, as the call it, the, the stress progressed and, and you started looking at maybe, maybe I need to go in a different direction. What was that thought process like? And what was the next steps? I mean, the, the next steps for me were like, well, let me ask, answer the first part of it, which is, you know, like, the thought process for me was like the um, sort of the internal conflict I had of like letting something go that was like, it was my baby. It was something that, you know, I put like, you know, my blood, sweat and tears into for many years and realizing that, you know, like once, once it's gone, it's gone, I'm never going to get it back. But then also realizing that, you know, I had so much uh, on my plate at the time that there was like this, this, feeling of needing to just rid myself of a lot of stuff so like not only did i you know end up like getting rid of um gameworn.net but i got rid of like i think all but one of my jerseys in my collection wow. yeah uh, with with mitch being the 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 primary beneficiary uh, he's got a lot of my um, imagine big, that big name jerseys <laughs> um but you know so i i was just going through a phase where i just wanted to like rid myself of anything that reminded me of the past and just like start from scratch, which is essentially what I did. 
um, you know, and I built back, uh, you know, a modest collection, but it was nothing like how I, you know, what I had before. So. And, and once you got through that period, and I guess, you know, let's, let's step back a second first before we get into that is, is, okay. So you decided you wanted to, to move on from this. How did you find uh, Spivak and Kraut to take it over? So I was pretty transparent about, you know, what I was going through. And I, and I think I, if, if, if memory serves me correctly, I think I reached out to a few entities that I felt would be, you know, um, obvious matches, like they would benefit from it or whatever. And Spiv Spivak and Kraut was one of the, the, the folks that I reached out to. But I also just like publicize, I say, hey, look, I think I'm ready to move on. You know, there's, you know, basically all you would be buying is a domain name, you know, the brand elements associated with it and, and, the, and the community, but there's no like income associated with it, right? There's no revenue, um, you know, uh, uh, to look forward to. So it'd be mainly something that um, you would use to have, you know, have an addressable audience for whatever it is you want to do with it. Um, and, you know, Spivak and Kraut was really the only uh, group that stepped forward with an offer and it's, it's a modest offer i mean like by today's standards i mean i i essentially gave it away um uh but back you then know, too us us all being in technology back then selling domains and selling those things they weren't a known that the, the, they had a big value like like those the domain names or or pages that are full of of users and things like they are now is is I think it took more of the the big dot com boom and then bust to start to get people to really understand that domain names and those things had a value and and because I mean it it's scary to look to see how that stuff worked back then and and it it is so much different and now you read hundreds of millions of dollars for a domain and you're like where the hell are they making that kind of money on it but but yeah it, it's not something that i would think would have even really crossed your mind to expect or or anticipate any big payday because nobody got that right right yeah that's correct yeah so so they decide to to take it over and and you transition out and what kind of what did I, what did you do post or or did you kind of just slowly transition out first? Yeah, so you know I, I I stayed on for a transition period that I think it was more than a year just because I mean there was just so many things that uh, David Spivak had to learn about you know the the site like just you know just how to FTP files you know to the site to like how to like get into the administrative console of the ultimate bulletin board and figure out how to like, you know, turn things on and off and, you know, all that stuff. And he was doing his own thing at the time. So it's not like he could just like put his head down and just like, you know, do like a crash course on it. He just, I just kind of like, you know, went along with this for a while. I was fine doing it. You know, I, I wasn't eager to like completely let go anyway. So it, it was fine, but it was about a year and a half or so before I finally just, uh, you know, kind of, released all the passwords finally, finally so, handed the keys over and said it yeah to yours. yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. and then you know you know to be honest um yeah i, I haven't looked back you know what i mean i don't even think i have an account on on the new game and it's not for any like you know negative reasons it's just you know it's sort of like you know i i had to like walk away from it and you know i you know i just thankful that at least you know, I haven't spoken with David Spivak in a, in a in a very long time, but it, when I last spoke with him, it sounded like the site was you know doing the job he wanted to do, which is to really like help elevate their their auction site. Um, but beyond that, I I haven't I haven't even looked to see who's still there or you know what the activity is like. And it's, I I guess is do you think doing it that way where you really stayed disconnected from it helped you out? And, and like you said, did you, did you get much more active in the hobby or have you stayed pretty low level? I was pretty dormant for a while. And even now I'm like very, like we have this whole new wave of collectors, right? Which is just great. But I don't know any of them, right? Like I'll, I'll sometimes I'll run into uh, Paul, Monica and Mitch at the, uh, at the games and they'll be surrounded by you know this this whole new generation of collectors none of which i've i've really met 
it's awesome that they're there, but I, I, I definitely believe that, you know, I've kind of like, um, sort of dropped back into the shadows a little bit. Like I said, I, I've built up a, a small collection of the things that are really near and dear to me. Uh, but I am not buying the way I used to buy 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and I guess, and I was saying about that as, as you're talking about that, especially with the young collectors is when we mention names like, like Mitch and Milt and, um, uh, and, all the others that were the uh, Doug Riesinger is another one that I, that I got to know because of, of your forum. And, and he's based out of St. Louis. I've done a, a ton of deals with him over the years. And uh, Joe Toman, those guys were the, the ground floor yep. sellers, collectors, all this stuff, but you're the, really the cornerstone for the social media side of game worn collecting. Because before you, I mean, yeah, there may have been, and, and Paul, step in with any of this, if you remember any of these things, is there may have been even the the, the bulletin boards and, and some other things, but there was no, no central website to go to until you launched this. And I mean, you are, if there was a, um, a hall of fame for, for game worn game you stuff, you would be in, in the, the cornerstone of that because, oh, of what, because of what you did to the hobby i mean it and it this may have never crossed your mind it actually it didn't didn't hit me until we started talking but you brought an entire group of people together that may eventually have had some other site to do that but you were it you were the innovator for for this amazing hobby and the 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 connections because i i know i met paul that way and and god didn't meet you in person till what eight seven eight years ago whenever chicago was but but had knew known you through there knew your reputation and and knew these other people for years before of actually meeting him in person and then what's funny because when you get into the uh the game worn pages on on facebook and that if people bring up the forum sometimes and say hey what was your username because we know some in some cases you never know what the person's real name was at all so i mean ha has this not that i threw this out there has that ever crossed your mind that you were really the one of the foundation guys of the game worn hobby i don't really think about it that way mainly because i know the hobby uh existed and flourished in pockets long before you know i, I created the site so uh i mean thank you for for uh, <laughs> for you know characterizing it that way, I definitely don't see myself uh, that way. And you know, I, I definitely want to acknowledge too that there was another site uh, at, at the same time. I don't know who uh, started theirs first, but there was a collector. I don't know if you remember named Jim Garland who had a website called GameWornJerseys.com. He had the the proper URL for all that stuff, and he also had a forum. And there were some people that were. Um, uh, you know, uh, sort of ensconced in that community before they came over to GameWorn.net. Again, I'll I will credit the Beckett article as really, you know, sort of bringing the waves of you know, the masses to to my site. But I mean, Jim Garland also had you know a project that he was working on independent from me, and I you know he he was also part of those early days as well. And I don't know if that's. And I may, I don't know that that's a name I, I know, Paul, do you, have, is he around still or do we know much uh, about him? I haven't heard of him or from him in a while. Um, that's a great, great question. Maybe someone can, can write in. Yeah. And yeah if anybody knows, shoot me a message or, or Paul or, or uh, if, if you're friends with John, uh, I don't know if you're on social media, John, I think I see you post, but, but yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook. So many names pop up. I don't always pay attention who it is. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, if, if anybody knows that, please shoot one of us that info. I'd, I'd love to throw it out on a, on a future episode. And, but, but I think like you said, is, is that one article? Cause I can only imagine when that, how long had the site been up when that article came out? Like a half a year. I mean, wow. it, it wasn't, it wasn't, I, you know, and I, I wish I could remember how that article even came to be. I mean, I certainly did not reach out to them. So um, the uh, sort of the editor of 
Beckett Hockey is a guy named Al Muir who um, has, has been the head of that publication for as long as I can remember. And I'm going to guess that he reached out to me. Um, and um, one of the uh, things that came out of this, not just like with the with the with the traffic coming in, but he invited me to write a few columns for Beckett Hockey, which I did like in around 2000. There was a couple of game worn jersey related features that I wrote, um, which I think kind of helped keep the the ball rolling in terms of like making the game worn hobby visible to people who were more card centric. And I think, sure. you know, that's what's happened to a lot of us. I mean, I'm sure a lot of collectors start off in cards and found their way into game worn Jersey. So that was a, a, a good stepping stone, I think for a lot of folks. And I'm guessing that, that when you were starting to worry about paying for using up all your traffic after that article, that had to be an insane jump. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, I, I you know, I honestly feel like, I think an article paid me like 80 bucks or a hundred or something like that. So it wasn't a big deal. It was mostly just an opportunity for me to sure. introduce the hobby to others. But yeah, I'm, I'm guessing after that publication hit when, when we read actual magazines, folks, for, for you <laughs> youngins, I know it's all you go, go read it on your phone, but when actually things came in the mail or you went to a store that sold these magazines and had to actually flip pages, that's, that was our, in some cases, that was our Google because yeah. you had back in the early internet, you had Yahoo, you had Ask Jeeves, a couple others, but the search engines weren't nearly tuned and set up like they are now where where it takes a couple words and you are exactly where you are. You had, you had to do much more knowing what you were trying to look for. So oh, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, Doug Reisinger. I mean, he was one of the folks, you know, for hockey with Hockey Gallery, Milts, um, uh, that and uh, yep. Sports Collectors Digest, SCD, were the places that people would go to, like, look for, you know, jerseys. Brad Fairmore, Fairmore Sports is another one. Um, a lot of these guys are, like, you know, early advertisers for game-worn jerseys and publications like Beckett and SCD. But it, it, it's just, it's amazing to see this history because, yeah, we, we all talk when we get together, us older guys get together and we all go back to the old days and hey, remember this thing or, or somebody will post in one of the, the Facebook pages, Milt's ad or somebody else's ad for, God, I wish I could still buy this player at this price. And, and it's crazy to look back because we just continue to speed forward as, as Paul, as you talked about with, the Barracuda auction, all that stuff, really, all, all you need is this. You need a phone, and you can be buying jerseys all day and all night and never have to see anybody, never have to talk to them face-to-face -face other than, hey, what's your PayPal? Send the money, this, that. It's it's instant. Back with those forums, it was – we seem to get to know each other a little bit more. And, and, and again, I think we're doing an okay job with that now, at least with, with some of those groups – but it was a much, even just doing jersey trades or jersey buying was a much longer process. When you decided to go buy a jersey from somebody, okay, you know where you had to go? To the post office or the bank and get a money order. <laughs> and then you had to go get a stamp. And then you had to make sure you had an envelope. And, and then you <laughs> mailed it and it took several days. And then it took several days for the jersey to come back. And um, and in some cases, it got if you were doing overseas stuff, because I know you had you had guys from all over the world in the forum. It wasn't just U.S. guys. So it, it it is so cool to have this look back, and and again seeing one of the 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 cornerstones of this, and and like it or not, you are. Uh, 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 it, it just how it is, but it's it's such an amazing piece to to be able to step back and look at the 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 late nineties that are far down the road it, it it sure as hell doesn't feel like that i graduated high school in 96 it doesn't feel that long ago but then you huh. start looking at it and you're like holy hell but it but it, it it is it's just you to be able to step back there and look to where we are now is just it's astonishing and and you've been in this a long time you you started the site because of the love for it 
how do you feel or what are your thoughts on the hobby now at, at February 1st of 2024? Well, it's, it's one of those, you know, careful what you ask for type of things where, you know, on one hand, I'm like, wow, you know, jerseys are just everywhere. Like they're so easy to access now relative to 20 years ago. But at the same time, um, there's so much competition for them. And sometimes that competition leads to bad behavior, right? And we've all seen, you know, bad actors when it comes to trying to secure that, you know, that one rail jersey that you really want. It can it can get ugly at times. And so um, the number of jerseys has increased to the point where we just don't see the game where that, you know, we, we saw in the late 90s. I mean, like... The, the, there's no hammered jerseys i mean we get all excited about finding like two repairs on a sleeve now and um uh and also the price points have gone up quite a bit i remember going down to like the san jose arena and buying a uh like truly hammered jeff odgers jersey with the c on it for a hundred bucks i mean wow. like those days are just like i i wish i could go back in time and just like buy everything off the rack um but um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, getting back to my first point is sort of like, in one sense, the Jersey um, hobby has exploded to the point where it's it's not quite mainstream, but it's de definitely something that most people are aware of that exists. Um, but because of it, you know, the the competition and the price points have, have definitely uh, been kicked up quite a bit. But, you know, I, I think Facebook's great. I think the the, the, the group's uh, that are available for people to join, not just the, the, the general game worn jerseys uh, group, but all the niche ones that sort of sprouted up uh, have been have been fantastic. And, and you know, that's the new game worn dot net in my mind. Well, you you are, like I said, if we ever started a, a Hall of Fame for for this hobby, you I think you would be one of the first inductees because of of what you did. And 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 I hope the the younger listeners that that we that basically that are our future of this hobby that will keep carrying it forward now have a better understanding of where it came from. I mean, yeah, we can, we have talked at length about the, the stuff in the magazines or, or, or early expos and that, but, but the using the early internet, which everybody again takes for granted, it didn't work the same way back then. I access for the early on my, my early internet I got through AOL when they sent me a floppy disk or a CD yeah. and, and dial up and it was slow and it, and it was, it wasn't the instant everything. And, and I had to sit in front of a damn computer. I couldn't pick up my phone and, and be anywhere to do this stuff. If I was making a deal or waiting to hear some back from somebody on a deal, I needed to be at my computer at home to check that email or send in the forum and check that message. And I may miss a deal because, okay, at one o'clock, uh, Paul puts up a Jersey and crap. I didn't get home till, till five from work and somebody else was home and miss it. It's not the instant posts that show up on every Facebook group that of here's 10 jerseys I'm selling. And of course you still got to be fast, but it's, it's the, the instant mentality or, or one of the comedians I fought, uh, one of my favorite comedians, Lewis black is the, the Amazon two day free shipping. It's, we weren't, we didn't have that back then. And it was, it was a simpler time. It was, you, you tamed the wild, wild west a little bit, but it was a, a clunky fun, but also uh, a, an amazing family that got built out of that. Uh, Paul, do you want to, want to interject something? I'm, I'm rambling on just because it's been <laughs> such a cool, cool topic to cover. No, I thought it's fascinating because I didn't know I knew a good amount of the history, but not as much as John went into today. And it's just um, it's very, very impressive. I, I guess going back to like the mid 90s, I don't even think there were Usenet groups for Game Worn Collective. I, mm -hmm. I mean, looking through the old archives and stuff, I can't find anything. And that's, you know, before. Well, even till the late 90s, Usenet was still a lot more popular than the web. You have yeah. to remember, dial-up didn't work well. You know, you couldn't use Mozilla. I mean, um, what was it back then? Um, Netscape? Netscape. Yeah, Netscape. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't use Netscape on it, on it then. Um, you needed PPP or Slip. And, I mean, I'll date myself. I remember having dot, 
dial up and buying TIA, the internet adopter, which actually turns your dial up line into a pseudo PPP line. So you could actually use the web browsers that were at Mosaic was the one I was thinking. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and everything, you know, mid nineties and before was really all text-based, you know, so like Usenet and like, I've never found any history of game war collecting being on any of the Usenet groups. And if anybody's got that history or ran one or whatever, let us know. Cause we'd love to, to throw that out as a, Hey, we had people reach out. I will share that and, and love to put that out there because it, it all hits on our history. We're honestly, we're all part of it. it it's this, this family, this group, NHL and, and hockey in general is not going anywhere. So um, it's it's cool to be able to to look back and, and see how we've grown, how we've kept those close connections and and how we till, still tell the stories of, of John, of your of of your page and your light bulb idea that that really that did it, it changed the hobby because, yeah. We, we all think about the buying and selling, but we also, I learned so much out of there. That was my first um, info on the custom crafted special stuff, or here's how you get a hold of this team, or this team sells it that way. Even back then, it was, here's, he, here's how the teams sell their jerseys. Some did, some didn't. And, and Paul still maintains a list of that. So we know how different teams do it different ways. Uh, in the, in the case of the blues, my first time I bought from their auction, it was by fax. The blues on their website had a, a fact sheet you printed out you, and with all the players, you put what your bids were and faxed it back to them. Didn't know like where your bid stood. If you were the winner or not until it was over and they called you and said, hey, here's how much you owe us. So it, it, it's, it's just amazing. And, and, this weekend with the uh, the expo out in San Jose, John, how do you feel about going out there? And and I know you're gonna probably relive all kinds of old memories with with Paul and Mitch and others. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't been completely like gone. I mean, I've kept in touch with with Paul. I've you know, of course, kept in touch with with Mitch over the years. But you know, I'm looking forward to to setting up. I'm actually gonna be. You know, I'm going to be with my my younger son, Kobe, who, you know, is really into, you know, hockey cards and stuff like that. So we're going to have mostly just hockey cards out there. But I'll be bringing out some of my um, jerseys as well, just to, you know, show and tell and stuff. No, don't uh, let but... Paul or, or Mitch hit you with the Zamboni. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, I guess what, and, and I'll ask this final question before we kind of wrap up and, and just touch on anything else before we get out of here is, how do you see the future of the hobby progressing? Uh, wow, that that's a that's a big topic because you know we're starting to see um you know fanatics is a is a powerhouse. I mean, they they I think they caught everyone by surprise, not just like you know, grabbing up inroads into the the jersey market, but also like sports cards as well. I mean, they're just like chomping you know up all sports memorabilia right now and so i think that you know we could be facing something where um you know we're just going to see more availability um but less wear um i think you know if you're holding on to stuff like pre 2010 hang on to it because that's that you're not going to see wear like that again i just don't I, I just can't see it no, and and you're right, and and as the materials change down the road, we'll say we know next year when Fanatics takes over the the uh, warehouse, it's it's the the rumor or not. I want to say rumors because we have confirmed them through sources. Is there's no dots on top. The material's pretty much the same, but going forward, who knows? And and we I mean remember the different eras of even the edge jerseys as each one wore differently we were I remember even us um talking in in with different people of uh when the Adidas ones came into play are they going to they cuz they were talking about the material are we going to see much wear are they going to hold up better and and I've been impressed with again not the the killer wear of the the 90s and two, early 2000s but seeing some good repairs and good holes and things in different spots. So we hope that 
doesn't go away, but, um, but yeah, you, you never know what the, what the future of the hobby is going to bring. Um, so before we, uh, wrap up here, um, John, do you have any just general things you want to cover before we, we get out or have you, you've covered a huge piece on your own? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, I, if anyone has any, you know, follow on questions that they want to send to you for me. I'm happy, happy to answer them. Um, I'm always looking to hear from folks I haven't heard from in a while. Um, but, you know, I mean, thanks for letting me tell the story. It was, it was a privilege. No. And, and I appreciate it. Paul reached out and said, here's what I want to have on. I'm like, Oh yes, that's <laughs> let's get this done. Uh, and I'm glad we we're able to work it out so quickly. Um, again, f- a phenomenal guest. And, and had I thought about it, and we'd we'd have had you on sooner, no matter uh, where. And it was just convenient. You could come to Paul's office and do it. Yeah, that's right. Paul, have you got anything? Uh, just want to, well, first, thank John for this. This is fabulous. It's really cool hearing a lot of the stuff. And um, I learned a bunch of stuff I hadn't known before about it. So but very fascinating. I did want to bring up, as you mentioned, this weekend is our expo. So Saturday at the Poor House Bistro Studio. Uh, we, uh, I think we start at 10, go to six or whenever Mitch drinks too many Coors Lights, you know, mm-hmm. however it works, you know, we'll figure out the ending time that way. And then, um, we also, it's the AHL all-star weekend. So we have the fireball cove for the Sunday and Monday games. We have a party after the games on Sunday, and we're just looking forward to having a great time. A few people coming in from out of town, um, should be a great weekend and we'll um do a recap on one of the future shows here i can't wait to see pictures and hear about that and i i one of the years i do promise to make it out there um hopefully we can we can pull it off and and i want to make sure i get to to many more expos like i was telling off the air i bought some some new mic cabling and other stuff to continue to uh to make my podcast set up even better um i wanted to touch on one other thing especially john you're talking about hockey cards and i don't know if you saw this or not i'm assuming you have um paul you may or may not but have you currently seen the 7980 uh heritage auction that they have going on right now Yes, Heritage Auction House. Yeah. Anybody that doesn't know, it's a 1979-1980 OPG hockey wax sealed case. 16 boxes, 48 packs, authenticated, only known case from Gretzky's rookie season. Um, Darren Ravel, which is a gr- he's fantastic on Twitter. Uh, it's Darren R O V E L L. Um, if you go look him up, has a video of it. Uh, did a, a little bit interview. They show how they opened the case from the bottom, checked every box, sealed in in plastic every individual card box, um, and then sealed it in in the actual main cardboard box it came in with. Uh, let's see. It ends on the. 21st of February. So 23 days to go with the buyer's premium at the current auction price. It is $1.89 million. That is insane. I would not be surprised if it reaches three. And the reason why I say that is when it comes to unopened material, the economics are kind of weird, like how they are between sports cards and jerseys where it's hard to explain to a person who only collects sports cards why having a whole intact jersey is worth X amount of dollars because they're used to pricing things in, in the card world, right? There's a catalog, there's a price guide, there's ways to look at it. Whereas jerseys are a little bit more, you know, sort of fungible when it comes to, to values. The same thing when it comes to unopened material, a lot of the traditional card correct collectors immediately jump to like, well, how many Gretzky's are in there and what will they grade at? You know, the chances of them grading at a PSA 10 are really low, but you got to remember, it's not really the point. The people who, the, the hardcore collectors who collect vintage unopened wax appreciate the unopened form, the artwork, the packaging, everything, and probably don't intend to to open it. Uh, And so it it creates this new price point where it's not about the cards inside. It's about the intact um, box and all the packs inside. 
And and it, I guess, and I say so I had somebody share this with me. I hadn't didn't know about it until till now, but it was insane to to look at this. And I think in the video, if I remember, I said correctly, they found it in Chicago. Um, and and they they tell the story behind it, and again they show the video of them opening up the cardboard box. But yeah, they I I think you're right. Reading some other articles I've seen on it, your valuation is is right in there. But but you're. I guess the other thing is, is, is it is the gamble is how many Gretzky's are inside that box. Is there one, is there 10? Will, will somebody actually go open all those or will they leave it at is expecting it to just, you know what? We'll never know. And the value is a value. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the last number um, I, I heard was that there's like, at least like three Gretzky's per box, like on average, of course it could be less, but I mean, the, the issue with OPG is that, you know, they, unlike tops cards are cut with a metal wire. And so like you get a lot of those rough cuts uh, on them. And so like grading them can be challenging though. I think PSA takes into consideration uh, that they're going to have rough edges, but you have like the centering problems and and all these different factors that go into grading. So my guess is that whoever wins this auction will sell the individual boxes and the people who buy the boxes will probably either keep them intact or get the individual packs graded and sell the packs separately. Um, but, and there'll be one or two guys that will ultimately open it up. I mean, it's just, it's just going to happen, but I, I, I do think that they're going to get into the hands of the, the serious unopened uh, uh, wax collectors. So, and, 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 you know, I don't know anything about this market at all is let's say somebody buys it and they get it for what, right at $3 million. If they then split those up, do you think they actually make more money by doing that? Or um, financially, how do you think that would work out? I mean, I, I don't know if you can just go and flip it tomorrow and expect to like make a ton of money on it, but that those boxes and those packs have done nothing but go up in value over time. I mean, I don't know if you can get like a single box for much under a hundred grand right now. Wow. So it, the, 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 the potential is there. It's just, um, it, it's, it's a different, uh, tier of collector. Let's see that Un, unopened material is another one of my hobbies. I am by no means like in that, you know, level where I've got like, you know, like unopened OPG Gretzky years, but you know, I, I do have stuff that goes back into the, you know, the seventies, uh, hockey, baseball and, and football. And it, it's, it's not dissimilar to the Jersey market where it's, it has its own sort of pricing structure. I, I can't imagine. And, and again, the whole thing being sealed cardboard box and all, and they, they explain when they open the bottom of the cardboard box, they're looking for extra, extra glue that the machine one that, I mean, it's, just like we do when when scanning jerseys, looking for wear and looking for different things, it's it is finite. I mean, I expected a magnifying glass to come out, but John, thanks for your information on that as well. I'd seen that come up the other day and wanted to uh, to just to mention that because of the we've talked to Heritage Auctions when they were at the at the St. Louis Expo, and then seeing what this is valued at. Um, once it closes, I will definitely mention it in a future show. Uh, any final thoughts before we get out of here, gentlemen? No, oh, I just want to make sure we mention the expo and looking forward to this weekend. That's basically all that's on my mind. Just hey, I can't wait to hear about it. And and um, Mitch has been sending me Zamboni videos and pictures and starting it up and playing with it. And it's he just looks like a, a big kid with his toy tractor. So uh -huh. I, I hope the expo is a, a fabulous time this weekend, gentlemen, along with the, uh, the AHL All-Star Game. So... Enjoy that. We'll get the details when we return next week. Like I said, a uh, a big and interesting show. I think it, it's going to be, a, a again, a discussion forum with Nick from uh, World uh, World Hockey Jerseys. So he's trying to get his, finally get all his stuff sold. And he's got some other stories he wanted to tell, reached out. So we've got him and other guests lined up in the future. So we'll see you next time. Enjoy. Give us a follow. Give us a like wherever you hear us just so I can kind of track that. I like to see us grow. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time.